said, there we go. When you said the arms and armor on that previous slide, you yeah. can standardize, it's all the infantry. Uh, all the infantry. All of the combatants of all the nations. Basically, in this period of time, we, have, we have two general types of infantry. We have legions and auxiliary palatine. They're basically the same. The auxiliary palatine are more, more barbaric. Their, their discipline isn't quite as high uh, as the legionary side. But they're still wearing the same equipment, the same shields, the same sh swords, and everything else. They're basically armed and armored the same. Now the auxiliary palatine are a little bit closer to what we'd say a light medium infantryman was, only because of how they were raised, not how they were trained. So soldiers from the Rhine River knew how to swim rivers. And in Julian's campaign, when the auxiliary found out they weren't part of the assault force, they got on their shields and swam the Tigris River so they could be part of the fight. So they didn't want to be left out. But one, going back to my original point is most historians do not go and look at logistics and they don't look at terrain. So today I'm going to just address a little bit about logistics to give you an idea of why misleading Julian in the desert or misleading Crassius in the desert by guides is basically made up by people that have never done it. To give an example, a legion or five legions of my period, or legion in the earlier period, 5,000 soldiers plus support personnel and the 1,330 mules, donkeys, and horses needed to carry their equipment required 17,000 gallons of water per day, per day. If you want to carry a day's worth of supplies of water, it's another 520 mules. If you want to do it two days, and notice what's happened to these numbers, What's that tell you? If you're a Roman general, you're not even going to consider moving your current camp unless, and we're talking about a small army, 5,000, unless there's a water source at that campsite that can supply 17,000 gallons of water. If it can't, you're not moving. So if you go back and look at Crassius being uh, misguided by guides, or if you could look at Julian being misguided by guides, it didn't happen. Because it's Julian, probably five field marshals, a bunch of counts and tribunes with him, they're not going to move the army unless they can have that access to water. And I'm using water because that's the easiest one. If you read my book, I go into supplies to everything else. So you start thinking in those terms. Also in Crassius' case, he was in Roman-controlled territory when he was being misguided. So when you go back and look and you place, remember the maps I was telling about? You actually place the places on a map and you realize where he's marching. He was there last year, at last campaign season. He walked through it. He knew what it was like. His soldiers were climatized. So again, what was the purpose that the author is writing the story? Okay, uh, now let's go to speeds. There's a lot of authors who put, you know, the Romans could march 20 miles a day and they were going X number, four or five miles an hour, and guess what? That's all BS. That's a fast walk. Well, I can walk five miles an hour. Yeah. Okay? That's... For a short period of time enough to pass a physical fitness test. Okay. But in reality, it's not the soldier who is the issue on the marching. It's the oxen pulling the wagons. Okay? Force marching in the old American Army before uh, World War I, was 2.5 miles an hour for 10 hours, okay? And they're carrying about the same load as a Roman legionnaire would carry if he had his armor on, which most of the time they didn't march with their armor on. 60 to 70 pounds, roughly? So roughly, but the Romans, if they were doing an administrative march, their armor went on a cart. That's right. <laughs> so that's, again, one of the fallacies when you start reading some historians. Now, an ox can do 2.5 miles per hour and 15 miles a day. Pack horses can go a little faster, but they still do 15 miles a day. This is the requirement per animal to allow them to do that. Now, I just read a, a paper on the watering of the Roman army, and they said the animals could go two days without water. You're right. If you can go two days without water, you take a strong animal, they become weak. And then you do it again, they die in droves. So. Anytime you violate this for your animal, now you can mess with it with people because we're motivated and stuff like that, but the animal just dies. And if you look at 
the campaigns that we have records of, you know, World War I, Civil War, the amount Australia sent 200,000 horses to war, none of them came back. They all died in Palestine and everything else uh, because they were overworked. My book on the Soviet campaign, the Russian campaign, hundreds of thousands of horses died there. Now, another thing is march tables and time, going back to Crass's example. When you're head of your column, so you got 50,000 men, the head of your column marches out of camp, okay? And it's going to the new camp, say, 10 miles. The column takes up road space of 10 miles in one column, 50,000 men. And if you go online, you'll see the math and everything else. So that tells you, and this distance going at 3.5, which is really humping it, that's going to kill your oxen in, in about a week. Okay, you got three hours from when the lead of the column reaches the new campsite. It's six hours before the trail lead gets to the campsite because they didn't leave until three hours after the head. Okay, now these become important for Julian, otherwise it wouldn't be going to these factors, but when you start putting these factors together, you understand the ge geography because you poured over the maps you know, believe it or not, the roads of today go in the same place as the, that everybody marched in the old days. You start looking at those factors, all of a sudden those hazy descriptions you're getting from the ancient writers start making more sense or that they're a little off as an idea. Um, and this, especially this time edition, now Julian, the reason this is, shows two columns, he marched his 50,000 men in two columns, but he made sure they were 10 miles away long because he wanted the full Persians to make him think he had more men. And he had a lot of men. He had 60,000 men, so didn't really have to fool anybody. These, these march rates are with or without traffic jams? Uh, that's just theoretical. Okay. If you have the traffic jams, you, it takes longer. Yeah. But the key is, is that today when we're looking back on them, we can't take them at face value. Right. Arminius Marcellanus, you can take at face value almost. He's a real officer just like Caesar. He was standing there for these expeditions. He's a physical witness, so you can start kind of believing him. The others weren't there. They're all doing it on hearsay. Okay, now, now we'll go into, uh, into Persia to give you an idea. This is a basically a sketch. I like to use sketches because you can get everything on one as opposed. Nispis, Singara, Singara Ridge, you should remember from the current war where uh, ISIS was trying to wipe out a bunch of people. Uh, this is actually Turkey, this is Syria, uh, this would have been old Iraq, Nineveh, we're all familiar with that from the Bible and everything else. Basically the Romans, when they were defending against the Persians, created a fortified zone in Mesopotamia, which would have been eastern Syria, southern Turkey today. The key to the place was the fortified city in Nisibis. A heavily fortified city had belonged to the Persians, the Romans got it in the 300s. They then created a fortified zone. Singara, heavily fortified. Bizabadi, heavily fortified. Ameda, heavily fortified. And there's a mountain range in here. Mardin, heavily fortified. Castrum Marium, we don't exactly know where it is. I place it there. Other people place it here. The reason I place it here, this means mulberry trees. You're not going to have any mulberry trees along the Tigris Euphrates in the desert down here. So I put it up back here. This was so important that the Persians couldn't take it and they kind of negotiated that the Romans turn it over. John, what do the letters mean? Okay, the letters uh, basically mean on this side, this is the first Flavia. This is the legion holding this port. This belongs to the province of Macedonia. I mean Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia. Um, Syria, and I forgot this is the Osoli something. It's the second province of Mas uh, Mesopotamia. This is a little controversial Trans Tigris, Tan Tigris, Tan Tigris. I'm the only one that actually says that exists. There was a ta Trans Tigris, I mean, to the east of Tigris, field army that existed at this time. The hints are there, but everybody's kind of overlooked them. So there's an actual Ro additional Roman field army. Uh, over in here. Now, there's two kinds of soldiers today, two armies. There's the 
Comitas, which is the field army, and the Limitate, which is the garrison army. A lot of times when you do your reading, they make the Limitati look like second class troops. Actually, you have to remember the Limitati are holding the border. They're fighting every day. They're not really second class troops. They're getting paid less. The field army got paid more, but they didn't fight as often. Weren't the Limitani also veterans who'd been given land to hold those borders? They would have been the sons of those veterans. Got it. Okay. Got yeah, they would be the sons of those veterans. By this time, these legions are hereditary in these provinces. Okay, now they can be pulled up to the field army and become pseudo comitatus and get paid less than the comitatus still. But basically, the Lemonati born and raised in that area. So you, basically, Germans that had come here married local women, and so their kids are, are uh, you know, pretty much familiar with the area, giving them the advantage against raiders and invasions and things. Now, these are the three invasion routes that Persia could come in to capture this zone. This is one up the Euphrates River. This is the one that uh, Shapur I in the 300s came and attacked and captured Antioch. It's not very used by the Persians on this one because if this is how uh, Julian's going to come down. It's very difficult to get supplies up the river. This is the second one, which Shapur II will use a lot. And this is the third, which he doesn't use. And the reason is that is you've got Visibeti and Casta Marine guarding there. Those two fortresses guard that entrance into uh, southern Turkey, north is the Sangara Ridge. So when the ridge is here, this is a big open area with a mountain in between. How many men would have garrisoned those? In that third area. Okay, uh, Lemonate legions were between 2,000 and 4,000 men. They're the holdovers from the old uh, ancient legions. So, like this is First Flavia, Three Parthia, Four Parthia, Second Flavia, First, Second Parthia, Fifth Parthia. These are holdovers from the earlier army. So, but they've been reduced in size. So, they run between 2,000 and 4,000 men, depends on where they are. In this location, they were probably a thousand men in the in their legions, uh, because the site because the sites have been excavated, the barracks complexes have been looked at, so the legions themselves. Now, well, they otherwise they've gotten too busy. If I added all the garrison locations of the cavalry, um, you would find this entire area is a cavalry series of cavalry forts, cavalry forts along in here. Uh, so you got 19,000 men in Mesop the province of Mesopotamia alone. So in this region here, there's 19,000 Lemonati soldiers garrisoning everything that's there and patrolling it on paper. <laughs> okay, now, Shapur's first campaign of 359, the war lasted 30 years, it started in 337. The most information we have is from, because uh, Amenius Marcellinus was there, is from 354 on. So Sephora's first successful military campaign takes place in 359. He masses at Nineveh, marches across, captures Sangara, and then he comes up behind the fortified zone. So there's still troops over here. The Eastern Field Army of 10,000 is in Edessa. And he comes up to a decision point. Do I go for the bridges at Edessa and at Zugmaga? Or do I start taking apart this fortified zone? He decides, probably at that point, take down the fortified zone. He had tried three times before to break in and just storm this place directly. He failed each time. So he's now doing the indirect approach, like Belisarius. Later on, will you be make famous with? Instead of going for the city, I'm going to knock out all the cities around it and isolate it. So in this one, he took out Sangara, and then he goes up to Am Amada. Now, Amada was where the Romans were going to mass their army to defend this area. So they burnt all the fields down here and didn't burn them at Amada. That's how we know that that was going to be a massing point. Also, six legions massed there and then got surprised by Shapur's 20,000 cavalry 
that ran through a mountain pass and basically pinned him into the city. He besieges it. He takes it at the last minute by a fluke. What kind of fluke? Well, basically what happened is, in my interpretation, is he dug a mine under the wall. He dug a ramp on top of the mine. So the Romans built their wall higher. And then according to uh, Manius Marcellinus, who was there, the wall all of a sudden collapsed and the Persian assault column immediately broke into the city, which tells us it was a plan to this. Because if it, had, if it like, had collapsed... That sounds like some brilliant engineering. It yeah, was. it was. The yeah, Persians <laughs> were really good at it. They dug a mine, they collapsed the wall, they had an assault column of their oh. elite cavalry dismounted, and they were immediately in the city. The Gallic legions couldn't respond. Uh, Amenius Marcellinus, you guys got to read this stuff. Again, it, it's got to be true because it's too bad that he makes it out and eventually makes it to, to the supreme commander of the region. But uh, this is on the 70th day of the siege. Shapur's ran out of food. This was a Hail Mary play. I mean, if he didn't win at that point, he had to leave. He lost 30,000 people. Most were peasants. Most starved. They didn't die in battle because he had eaten up all the supplies he took and he ate up everything in the area, and so he left 30,000 peasants dead in the area, according to our, uh, the record. Could have been less, but it, basically he got it by the skin of his teeth. Next campaign, so he's knocked off Amida. He's knocked off Singara. The Romans, so now, this is the next year, he comes in, pops up, captures Bedebeah, and then sits here. Now at the time, the emperor at this time is Constantine II. Notice I never mentioned the Comitas army up to this point. The theory is the Illuminati will hold out, and when there's an invasion, the, the, uh, the Comitatus army will come in and fight. Didn't show up last year in 359. That's why, they get, now this year, uh, Constius II goes, uh, I got to stop fighting the Sarmatians and Goths up here on the Danube. I got to do something about here. My, my uh, eastern flank is collapsing. <clears throat> so the Persians come in, they knock out here. Constius comes over at the end of the season, around November. He tries to take it back and he doesn't. So now we're at 360. Uh, Constius, the next campaign, 361 campaign of the Persians is going to mass here and go directly for Nisibis because they've taken it out all the way around. Now, in that campaign, Constius puts parts his army there, so the 361 campaign is a, a phony war just like at the beginning of World War uh, II on the Rhine, two armies looking at each other over the Tigris River. You know, the full weight of the Roman army, Argus. So, Shapur is here, Constius II is here, and they're looking at each other across the river, and nobody does anything. Constius, I mean, Constius II has a problem. His name is Julian the Apostate, his cousin that he put in charge of the uh, West, who's now revolted. So, right as winter comes in, he counter marches into the. Uh, uh, Balkans to fight Julian and Constius II dies. Great thing for the Roman Empire at that particular second, no civil war. So now but a change of strategy comes in. For 25 years the Romans and the, and the Persians have been fighting. The Romans have been fighting a defensive strategy. Relying on their defensive positions Shapur beating his head against all these cities that he figured out how to take in 359. And it's really a stalemate. It's also a non-Roman way to fight. Romans are offensive minded. Even in this period where they're really kind of on the defensive, they want to go and attack and thump somebody. They want to burden somebody else's villages. That's how the Roman mindset thinks. So for the 25 years that Constantius II is doing this fight against the Persians, he is being criticized by everybody, church people, historians, other military people, for taking a defensive strategy. Why doesn't he just mass and go in after it? For one very good reason. 
At this time, the, emperor, it, the empire is divided between the three sons of Constantine. The field army of Constantine of 100,000 men has been divided into three parts. Basically, he has only 40,000 men in his field army in Constantius II. How many men does King Shapur probably have? About 40,000 men, which means is you're not going to win. It's a stalemate. Even if you have, they had four open field battles, all became stalemates for one reason or the other. He can't take the offensive. He doesn't have the manpower. But now when he dies, the empire is finally reunited again, and Julian the Apostate, i.e. he's also the guy that tried to push Christianity back and bring paganism as the state religion, apostate, that's why he's an apostate. He now has the full field army of Constantine the Great, Constantine the First, massed, 100,000 men, the offensive power of the Roman uh, Empire, massed under one leader. So now he does have the manpower to go back in and take on the Persians. He's also going to do a, basically a battle plan that Constantine I had planned to do in 337, but Constantine I died. And it's basically his two armies, 